All right, so we are going to finish maybe today model analysis. So we were talking about the formulation for model analysis and we got some definitions and we apply those definitions to this problem. In this problem, we calculated the excitation. And as I said last class, because Kelly has this question, the excitation, it was not fully appreciated in this system because we have just one machine. But the system that we need to study today has two machines. And that's what we're going to do today. Now the system, we have the code in Canvas. We run time domain simulation for this system. And this is the base case. The data is here, um, but one change that we made in this system and with that we obtain very different results was to change the inertia. In a real system, we're not going to change inertia. You have the system there with power plants and we cannot change that. That's a physical characteristic. Maybe the only way we can change it if, is that generator is not available. When it's not available, you remember 421? The system can change. So sometimes you might have a generator, sometimes you are not going to have any generator. Off. And we can call that problem the unit commitment, right? But when you have a generator, it's there. The inertia cannot be changed, right? Uh, but why did we change the inertia? Because it was a practical thing. We're engineers. We have a, our code is working for that system. And we, we develop all the equations for a short circuit in bus two. The other thing we could have done, let's try the short circuit at bus three, right? And, but that will require more classes developing an equation and see what are the equations we need to include to have a short circuit in bus. But we are engineers. What did we do? Just flip the system. Well, what is the meaning of having a short circuit in bus three? Well, that is the short circuit in, in the bus with the generator with the least inertia. Okay, instead of writing all the equation again in bus three, let's change the inertia. Again, do you understand? We're not, we cannot change the inertia in the system, but we are just testing different things, okay? So we will do that too. When we run the time domain simulation, Kelly, what do you remember when we change the inertia? It was out of phase, and also the dynamic response was strange. In the base case, which is the one that is in the slide, the oscillation was very beautiful, like uh, sinusoidal signals that were moving. And we will understand today why. Why in this case we have that response, why in the other the case when we change the inertia, then we have something more complicated. And that has to do with the excitation. So first thing, it's a system with eight state variables, 10 algebraic variables, large. If we need to get the Jacobian matrix, the Jacobian matrix include the differential equation and algebraic equation are 18 rows and 18 columns. That's pretty large. We're not going to do it by hand. Uh, it will take a long time to develop all of that. But I explained last class, and if you were not here, you need to go to the videos and watch the part where we develop the equations to obtain the numerical estimation of the Jacobian. It's there in the videos. Go and watch it. So if we apply the same procedure for this system, because we do have the function differential equations and algebraic equation, all of them, and we apply this procedure, we can estimate the full Jacob. What I have in the figure is show the Jacobian, but just show a dot whatever we have a non-zero term. So this Jacobian has most of the terms are zero, just a few of them that are zero. Can you spot any row or column that you are familiar with? Do you remember the order of the Jacobian or the equations? EQ prime, then, and then 
delta. How is the equation for delta? Very simple. Omega s, omega minus omega s, which is constant omega s. So that rho depends on just one variable. Do we see it here? Yes, it should be in row three for machine one and row seven for machine two. It's there. It seems that the structure at least is fine. Well, we can we need to double check and make sure that we're not making any mistake, but I did it. This is fine. This is the estimation of the Jacobi. Okay. I will show you the numerical value very soon here, and we are going to work with MATLAB. But here, let me go through some of the results. When you have this Jacobian, which is a matrix of 18 by 18, we need to eliminate the algebraic variables from the system. So we need to apply the current reduction. Are you OK with this procedure? Do you have any question? No? OK. So you are good with that. After applying the current reduction, then we have a reduced representation in which we're going to have just the equivalent differential equation with respect to the state variables, nothing else. Yeah. The algebraic representation is put just constrained into the dynamic behavior, but these constraints are already included in this reduced representation, which is linear. So with this matrix, which is eight by eight, because we have eight state variables, then uh, we can uh, represent the system in a linear fashion, just very close to the equilibrium. We pick this matrix and we proceed calculating eigenvalues and everything else we may need. We can calculate the eigenvectors also associated to each of the eigenvalue. And here I have the summary of eigen values. The first two are complex quantity. We have a real part that is negative, an imaginary part that has to do with the oscillatory behavior in the system. We apply our definition of damping ratio and frequency, uh, the frequency of the oscillation. And these are the results we have. Based on these numbers, then this is different from the previous system, Kelly. Why? In the previous system, we have a pair of complex eigenvalues, just one. And as I explained, this come in conjugate pair. So last time, we have just one pair of those conjugate eigenvalues, right? And that is related with just one type of dynamic behavior. Thanks to David, we have a different name for mode and maybe more uh, casual and we understand it better. It's a type, it's, it's a mode of dynamic behavior, just one. Why? Because we just have one machine that oscillates with one fixed point, which is the infinite. But now we have two. If because we have two, then we have two possible types of oscillatory behavior, which are described by this data that we have here. One of them is going to be very, very critical, yeah because we don't have any contingency and the damping ratio is already very close to 5%. So if we are the operator of the system, we cannot, we should not, not cannot, we can, but we should not operate the system with that condition. Why? Because the system is going to be very close to have negative oscillatory behavior. Why is so negative to have a damping ratio of 5%? Because the oscillation will remain a longer time in the system, and the system will be, be prone to have a failure eventually. And in the past, uh, we have experienced in real systems that these oscillatory behavior, when they're sustained over time, they can lead to other problems in the system, even leading to the blackout of the power system. So we don't want to operate the system with that type of dynamic behavior with so low damping ratio. This one has a frequency of 1.45. And the other mode has a better damping ratio, more than 10%. We said over 10%, we're fine. We're good. And that's a good 
eigenvalue and type of oscillatory behavior. The frequency though is much higher. At some point in our class, we talk about this. We talk about energy, the energy involved in the oscillation. And we start talking about how this is related to the damping ratio. Do you remember that discussion? And we try to come up with not a mathematical answer, but a practical answer that we can remember. Uh, do you remember? I think you, David, were asking about that, if I remember correctly. Yeah, so the one with higher frequencies, less energy. Less energy. So what would be less energy in this system that we have two machines and one infinite bath there? Less energy would be Okay, maybe one at a time. So we will see that type of behavior, and that will be the one with a damping ratio of more than 10%. So what is the critical one in the system that remain longer is the one that has more energy involved. And we will see that that will be the two machines together oscillating with the infinite bath. Yeah? So that's going to be more energetic and that will remain longer in the system. There is some definition that I didn't want to talk about it, but if you work on this in the future, maybe you will hear about it and maybe you will have to learn it, which is the participation factors. Participation factors will help us to mathematically determine, given an eigenvalue and eigenvectors, we can determine immediately through a mathematical calculation, what kind of physical behavior that mode is related to, yeah? So that's something we, we will not talk about it. I don't wanna make it too complicated. Uh, it should not be really complicated, but let's skip that part this semester. So if we plot the eigenvalues, this is what we get. The blue segmented line is 5% damping ratio, and we are a little bit better than that. And the other is a little bit better than the red segmented line, which corresponds to a 10% damping ratio. So if we have to improve the operation of the system, then we need to do something with that mode, that, that type of oscillatory behavior related to this eigenvalue. And here I have the numbers again. So this is a damping ratio of 5.37%. The oscillation frequency is 1.45 Hertz. And if we get the inverse of this, we get the period. And that period is almost 0 0.7 seconds, okay? And that's what I have for today. And now we're going to work with the system. And you see already some stuff there and I need to change the font let me do it quickly the font is there 18 all right and in this case then you have this code chapter six two machine infinite bus system version three so I was playing this morning, and we're going to also put as an output the matrix of eigenvectors and the eigenvalues of the system. When we clear the fall, we're not making any change. We're self-clearing the fall. So we're calculating these eigenvalues at the equilibrium point, because after the fall, the system go back to the equilibrium point. And this is what we got. So that's the plot, we already have that. This is a plot in a subspace of the phase plane. What is the dimension of the phase plane here? In the total phase plane, how much? Eight, we have eight state variables. So it's in eight dimensional subspace. But in that, we're looking just here at a part of that subspace. It's like when you have a 3D component, you see this is a battery, and 
nine volt battery, you see that it's 3D. You, you can see it from different angle. But what about if I show it like this? What do you see? You don't see a 3D, you see just a rectangle. The same thing here with this plot. We're just looking at the particular angle of that space. And with that, we say, well, we have an unstable focus. And the most important plot is that one. So this is the first case. What did we learn when we ran this time domain simulation? This is pretty smooth and regular. And the, the, there is just a clear oscillation. We saw the two speed in the machine or increasing together in decreasing together. They don't have the same speed, but they're increasing and decreasing together. Yeah? And we can determine here uh, what should be the, 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 the period of the oscillation. And we can look here, for example, and then let's make it approximated. This is 2.5 four seconds so 2.4 seconds and this is 2.4 seconds how much do you have here let's make it approximated 3.1 so what is the period huh? 0. 0.7 0. 0.7 and that is very close to what we determined what we determined then was this calculation so what kind of mode we are observing the one related to this one, the one with the lowest damping ratio. And because it has the lowest ramping ratio, is the most energetic. The two machines are oscillating in phase, both increase energy and decrease the energy. And that is exchanged with the infinite time. So that's the one that is, has been excited in this case. The question is, are we going to always have this situation? And it's not. For completeness, let's do what Kelly asked a few uh, classes ago about the excitation. So let's try to calculate what we discussed before we, with the excitation. And to refresh your memory, let me go back to the equation, which is right here. The excitation has to do with this part. So we need to calculate delta x zero. And with that, we can calculate this vector. The magnitude of each term in this vector should give us the amount that the mode has been excited. Some term will be small, the mode has not been excited, right? Some, some terms are large, the mode has been excited. What we're going to expect in, in this case? Well, we're going to expect that the mode three, four, that has been excited and that that should show that in the back so let's do it so to do this uh i haven't i haven't worked on on the code on this what i did on the code and I, i'm going to put this today i put all the information for the oscillatory mode here you have the damping ratio the oscillation frequency they have the mode excitation for these two cases and the mode shape for these two cases. And we're going to get this. What is the mode excitation? Is a term we're going to calculate now. It's Q inverse multiplied by delta X zero. When you do that, you have some complex quantity, but if you get the absolute value of all those terms, we're going to get this for the mode. So you can see here, which is the mode that has been excited the most is the second one, exactly the one we are observing. That was excited, why? Because we had a short circuit at bus two. The other thing we're going to see here is the mode shape. What is the mode shape? It has to do with the other term. this term right here, this part. So basically, for each mode, when, when we pick one mode that will point a specific column of that matrix Q, that's the eigenvector associated to that mode. So if we look at that mode, uh, that column, we're going to see again complex number that has to do with the terms of the eigenvector associated to that mode. 
But if we see the angle, as we discussed before, the angle will give us information whether this mode is being manifested in phase or counter phase or any other combination. So we will do that. No, no, not always. That depends on the disturbance, and that's what we're going to see when we change the inertia. Yeah. Um, so for this part, are you with me with the mode shape? It's just the angle. So you have exponential of lambda i t, and that term need to be in, in some other the, the term related with the excitation, and that will be multiplied by one of these terms in this column. So that that term will tell you how the mode will be manifested in that variable. So we will look at this for the speed, for example, and we will see how that mode will show up in the speed of machine one and the speed in, of machine two. If they have the same angle, the meaning is the manifestation of the mode is going to be the same, okay? And that's what we're going to find for the critical mode. You, we calculate the angle for for that that term. So help me here. What is the mode shape omega one? What is that? We're looking at what mode? We're looking at that mode. So the mode is this is the mode lambda three related to lambda three or lambda four. So let's call it lambda three t. That's the mode. And that mode will have some term that will be related with the excitation. But then this mode, uh, we need to pick the third column of Q. So you will have Q, all rows, third column. This third mode is related with the third column of Q. So this mode will be multiplied by each of the term that we have in that column. So this uh, matrix Q will be uh, for, for the speed of the machine one. What is the position for the speed of the machine one? We have EQ prime, EV prime, delta, and speed. So if we look at this, this is a complex quantity. Now, if we get the angle of that, it will tell us how this mode will be manifested in that omega one the same thing we will do for the next one what what is the next one uh is the other variable which is omega two so omega two so we have e eq prime ev prime delta and omega then we have eq prime second machine we have a ev prime delta and omega eight so now if we look at the eight row of the same column because we're talking about that mode then you will get the mode shape related to speed two and this will tell you how this mode will be manifested on this speed okay now let me go back to the slide Here we have the mode shape for the speed of the machine one and machine two. What do we observe there? The angles are about the same. So if this mode is excited, it will be manifested in a similar fashion in the speed omega one and omega two. So if the speed is increasing or this term is increasing at some time, that increase will be manifested in the speed of machine one and two at the same time. If this is decreasing, the same thing. That's why we see it in phase. But the physical meaning of that is that there is a lot of energy that is being exchanged between these two machines and the infinite bus. Yeah? What about the other mode? The other mode is different. What do we see here? Counter phase uh, behavior. While the mode, this is the mode related to lambda one while the mode will be manifested with this angle with that shifting in the other machine will be totally opposite right that's what we are observing here what kind of behavior that would be 
uh, Ryan? If the mode shape are in opposition, what kind of behavior we will have in the system? We have the mode shape of the machine omega one. The, the machine one, this is the mode shape in the speed of machine one. How many degrees there? Negative 82. But then for machine two, the mode shape is positive, almost 96. So they are in opposition. Opposition means if the mode is increasing at some time, that will be manifested in the opposite direction for machine one, yeah? And machine two will be opposite. We are creating a shifting with this um, mode shape. So the mode will be shifted because of that angle we have there. But the point is, because these are in opposition, almost 180 degrees, what happened in machine one will be the opposite in machine two. The, right, right. So do you, uh, do you see this? Then we're going to use the mode shape in that fashion. These two pointing in the same direction. They are in phase. They are together oscillating. If they're in a position, they are going to be oscillating again each other. There is exchange of energy from one machine to another. Now, let's do the calculation at least one uh, to show how we do this. So you have you have a simulation. Let's, uh, let, let, let's consider just one case. Uh, we're going to have here, maybe this is one per unit, and this is the speed of machine one, which is very close to bus two, and we have a short circuit at time zero. So how the speed will change when we have a short circuit? Increase nonlinearly, quadratically, how? Probably linearly. Why? Because the short circuit is very close to the machine and the accelerating power is almost constant, right? And then the increase will be linear almost. But at this point, in this case, we have 0 0.1 seconds. This is time. The fall is released. So for that speed, then we need to see how is going to be the evolution from that point to the um, equilibrium point. And we need to see how this will change in time, right? And the same thing will, will occur for all the variables. So at this point, we need to determine how much are the state variables because we are going to determine how much is that delta variable we need to determine delta x zero at that point. And here we have all the variables, not just the speed. When we determine that, then we're going to multiply this from the left by Q inverse, and we will get the coefficient we need. But to get this again, what do we need? The variable at the point when we clear the fault, and we need the variable at the equilibrium point. We need the delta value. So if I come here, we have the short circuit and the short circuit simulate for a time of 0 0.1, then, oh, thank you. Yeah. So in the code, we will have the short circuit. And then at this line, we need to have the same point that we, we were talking about to initialize the simulation for when the fall is clear. So we can stop the code right here. I'm going to put a breakpoint right there, and we're going to take that value. That's a vector of all the variables in the system after we clear the fall. So we run this, uh, and the code is stopped right there. So we have here,
Z0 is the equilibrium point, that's the vector. And Z0 full clear is that one. So I need to take the difference between these two. Let me call it delta Z, which is going to be Z0 full is clear minus Z0. That's delta Z, but Z has a state in algebraic variable. So I need to pick in this vector, what do I need to pick in that vector? Yeah, the first eight, yeah. So we will pick the first eight here, and that is delta x zero, just the, the one that we need for this calculation. We have already, I, I, I have that already here. Uh, I modify the code here at some point here. I modify the code to calculate the Jacobian uh, numerically, as we described last class. So this is a for loop we need to estimate the Jacobian. And then we have the cron reduction. We calculate the system matrix, and then we calculate the eigenvalue. So the matrix Q is already calculated. What is the size of Q? Because that's the reduced system. How much is that? Eight by eight. So if we get inverse of Q multiplied by delta x zero, we get this. Yeah? What do you see? It's not very clear because it's complex, right? So what I'm going to do here, uh, let's call this mode excitation. Uh, I'm going to get the absolute value of the mode excitation. That's the one. Uh, and, and also what I can do here, the absolute value, I'm going to put next to this, I'm going to put the IAM values. So we know what we're talking about. And, oh, I'm sorry. So D is, D is eight by eight, I'm sorry. So D need to be, just a column vector there. So uh, yeah, this is that absolute value and, and, and it show an imaginary term because the first column is complex. But we just look at this number. So the one that or the highest, this is one. And this is exactly the mode we had been discussing. This is the most energetic, the two machine oscillating together with the infinite bus. What are the other that has very high uh, mode excitation? The real one. And we have here two of them, okay? What kind of uh, dynamic behavior that might be? We have a guess, huh? exponential. exponential decay in what kind of physical uh, behavior there we might have? Where, where exactly? The dampers, probably highly related to the dampers, very fast decay in time, okay? And those are excited. If you have a fault, they will be excited all the time. But uh, the one that are complex, the first one, which is the one, Ryan, that's the one that involve machine one and machine two oscillating against each other. That has not been excited much, a very small percentage, yeah? Of, these are not per, uh, per unit, by the way. These this are just, it's a magnitude there, but uh, the highest one is related to this uh, lambda three and lambda four, which is the two machine oscillating together with the infinite bus. Are you with me? Can you identify this for any system? We need to do this calculation just to verify that that is the case. Yeah. The point is, will be always, we will always have this behavior, yes or no? No, that depends on how the system is excited. 
And what is going to excite the system the most in this case is going to be the type of disturbance. So if we change the location of the disturbance, the modes will be excited in a different way. Yeah. Uh, and again, let me repeat what I said at the beginning. We don't want to modify the equation here, and we're going to spend another class developing the equation. We're going to just flip the system and change the inertia and see what we get. Are you with me? Yeah. Okay. So let me stop the simulation here. Right there. We stop the simulation. We close the figure. And we will modify the system now to see what a different set of inertia in the system might create. So we go to the data. We have data for the generators. And here's the one for. Here's the one for machine two. So machine two has six seconds, and we're going to flip it. Now this is three. And this one that is three now is six. Why we're doing this? Because we want to see how any disturbance that now is closer to a generator with less inertia, we want to know what that might lead to. Yeah, before we have the short circuit close to a machine with the largest inertia. Now the opposite. And we want to see what that might create. So if we run this again, oh, we have this stopping point there. That's the result. What do you see there? Um, uh, Ryan, what do you see there? Higher. Yeah. Uh, we are just studying the the impact of the disturbance, but we're, we're modifying a little bit the system because we modify the inertia now. The eigenvalues change. Yeah, but if we don't do that and we do the proper thing of just changing the location of the disturbance, the original eigenvalues should not change and should be the same. But a, a fault in a different location might excite in a different proportion the mode. But this is a way around. We should be OK with it. They change a little bit, eh, maybe a lot. But uh, let's assume that this is the starting point now. And we have a short circuit closer to the machine with the smallest inertia. Um, what do we have here? Uh, we have the face plane. What the face plane tell us? We talked about this before. At least we have some, we're, we're suspicious here. It's not very homogeneous as the one before. Something is going on. The dynamic, uh, the, the dynamic response is more complex now. That's all that we can say with that. And then when we see the time domain simulation, yeah, there is some. What can we do immediately before doing anything? We look at the period. And we will check the period right here. We can look at this two point, for example. Yeah. Who will do the calculation here? This is about, let's make it simple 1.2, right? 1.2. And this is 1.2, and the other is. 1.7, so the period is about half, 0 0.5 seconds, right? Yeah. Let's see what we got. Here's the summary of the system. What can you say now? The first mode now, again, is the one more energetic again. But look at this. What can you say? 
counterface. So what kind of behavior do we have? Yeah. So the type of dynamic behavior is exchange of energy between machine one and machine two again. Yeah. It's the one that remain long, the longer in, in the system is the most energetic again, but it's different to what we had before. The most energetic was the two machines together oscillating with the, with the infinite bus. But in this case, that's the most relevant. We can see the, the excitation of the mode, and that has the largest number. So we are exciting this mode importantly. And this is very opposite to what we had before. Yeah. Um, the other mode, the other mode um, it has a better damping ratio. And the other mode has less frequency. You mentioned this, David, before, that maybe if, if you have more machine involved, the, the frequency will go down, right? And you mentioned the term of inter-area oscillation, right? We still observe that. The frequency is going down here, but uh, the damping ratio here is higher. So the, 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 the frequency of this oscillation will be smaller here, but, but uh, it, it gets... Um, but uh, it, it get damped out uh, quickly. The other mode, as you can see here, what kind of behavior is this? It's not clear, right? But we can say that they are kind of pushing kind of in the same direction. This is by no means uh, an oscillation between machine one and two, but together in some strange fashion, they are going to be oscillating with the infinite bus, yeah? Um, that's what we get from here. And we're going to repeat uh, the, same, uh, the same analysis we did before. So we, we have the simulation. We are going to calculate this again. We have the uh, uh, variables at the clearing uh, of the fold. And we're going to calculate that delta Z. In delta Z, we have all the variables. Now, we're going to pick just the first eight terms because these are related with the state variable, which are the, uh, those right there. And then we're going to get the inverse of Q, and that's the quantities we get for the mode excitation. So if we get the absolute value of this, we observe that those are the numbers. And as we discussed, this is the highest one. That mode, machine one and two oscillating together now remain longer in the system. And the other is still highly ex excited, right? Um, but why we don't see it much? Because we do not see it much. Do you think we, 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 we see that? Uh, we, we can look at, at this one. This, this here, you have the two speed. Uh, if I make a zoom here, what do you see there? Opposite behavior. When the speed in this machine goes up, the other goes down. They're oscillating against each other. And that's the one that remains the longest. At the beginning, well, we have something strange. It's because the other mode has been excited as well. Any question? Any question? Yeah. This, I, I, I think that I asked you in the, one of the first question of the homework to do the model analysis. You need to work on this, on what we talked today. So let me know if you need some further clarification. But with this part, we're going to be done. What we're going to do for next system we will study, as I said, we're going to use the code I created with my PhD student. And with that, we can simulate any system. We, we just need to put the data. Have you ever worked with Math Power? Which software did you use for 421? Well, you used like our school in that lab? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. You, you use it. You, Kelly? No? Oh, that's all that. Oh, yeah, we use that. Yeah. 
Kishan, do you use that one? Yeah. Parul. Yeah. yeah. So that math power has a structure for data. Um, and in my code, I use the same type of structure for the grid. But because math power doesn't run time domain simulation, I added dynamic data that we need to use, and the format is similar. The definition of the columns or where, where the age, for example, of a machine is located, that change, of course, but uh, that because it's new. We, you don't have that in math power, but it's the same type of way to store data and call it and to run a simulation. I can go through that code uh, that I created with you uh, uh, one of these days. Uh, you don't need that for the homework though, but for all the system that we will study uh, next, we're going to use that code. Let's wrap up, question. Uh, in this code, do we calculate the uh, Jacobian numerically? Um, so you use the initial as being not the equilibrium? Yes. And in the code, is it, is Z not supposed to be a column vector or a row, and it doesn't matter? Oh, it does matter. It need to be a column vector for our calculation. Yeah. When I, I, I changed that a little bit we, because we did the initialization. And before, I think this was a row vector. But all that it took was to use an apostrophe there. Now is column vector. So we use that vector directly to do the multiplication right here. Yeah. Can we use like, the initial? First initialization because this one's the default clear. Can you use the, the original initialization? As, as, I, as I explained here, if you use the, initial, the initialization, which is the equilibrium point, you're going to be right there. If you, you put that in the linear, linear model that we develop, delta x will be zero, delta y will be zero. The system will be at the equilibrium point. Nothing will happen whatsoever. But when you are here, the system, the variables in the system have changed because of the short circuit. That's why we need to get this different here, delta omega one. And we will do that for all the variables. So can you use that? You have to do that to get the delta variable. And also you need to use the one right here when you clear the fault. So our approximation after the system has been clear, the, the fault has been clear, we can anticipate that the system will behave if, if we're close to the equilibrium point, very close to the linear description that we have. That's our assumption. And so for, for the Jacobian, we use the, the point on that. So our delta is just minus zero. Uh, for the Jacobian? Zero. Yeah. So the Jacobian always need to be calculated an, at an equilibrium point because our linearization is based on that assumption. The system is around an equilibrium point in a, in a neighborhood of that equilibrium point. We want to see how the system will behave. The closer we are to that equilibrium point, the better the linearized model will behave. In practice, when you analyze a system, you don't calculate this, yeah? But we're doing this calculation of the excitation so we can understand. We can understand that different disturbance can excite the mode in a different proportion. The mode will be there, but might not be excited. Yeah? And then we will have a controller, and this is the last thing I, I will say. We will have a controller in the system if you have a mode that is poorly damped, we, we, will, we will not like that. And we need to design a control mechanism that can move that eigenvalue to the left. So the system will have better damping. We will do that. You might design that and you might leave it in the system. But what about if the mode has not been excited? You will still have the controller. Now the question is the controller will benefit the dynamic behavior of the system or make it worse? What do you think? We don't know, it depends from system to system. But it would be fair for us to at least question that. 
uh, most of the design uh, we have uh, in system, they design the control uh, system for one particular mode, but that mode might not be excited. So recently with my PhD student, we came up with, and we got a proposal, a research proposal approved by NSF to work on how we can adaptively coordinate these controllers. And the adaptation so far has been turning this controller on and off. Because if the mode has not been excited, maybe it will be beneficial for the system to have that controller removed. In the system today, if you have those controllers, they are there. And you don't have any smart decision to do anything with that. And that has to do with the discussion, the mode excitation. Any question? Any question? We're done with this part, and then we should start like discussing um, controllers, voltage controllers, frequency controllers, and we will also discuss the the software that I I created, and I will put that in Canvas. Thank you, guys.